Good morning and welcome. My name is Michelle Adair. I'm the CEO here in Cystic Fibrosis New South Wales. Uh, for those of you that are a part of our New South Wales community, please make sure if we haven't that, that you, uh, you give me a shout and say hello. It's always lovely to meet you. Uh, very often though I won't recognise you if we're connected on Facebook because so many people these days have got profile photos of their dogs or you know, other things. So uh, if we've not had a chance to say hello, please do. And from those of you outside of New South Wales, a very warm welcome. Um, a number of times already people have said this is their first conference or of course their frequent flyers and the common theme is consistently what a wonderful, friendly, welcoming community this is. And I couldn't echo those words more strongly enough. So it's great to have you with us, and I hope you've enjoyed the program. In considering travel with CF, it's a very topical issue. Uh, I think that's fairly evident by the number of people in the room. And it's one of those things that, as families, and particularly for young people these days, we take for granted. There is an expectation at some point, if you've not even travelled as a child with your parents, that at some point you'll finish school, you'll do a gap year, you'll graduate, you'll go backpacking for a while, you'll do that. So as a part of our ongoing expectation that lives are lived completely, individually, flexibly, optimistically and wonderfully with CF, the opportunities to travel and to enjoy that experience is one, it sounds like I'm on air, um, is one that um, is very important and it's just another one of those options. How to do it practically and sensibly. You will get, it's fair to say, a different response from clinicians. Some are more cautious than others. Some are just like, yeah, go for it. And the reality there, of course, in bridging and having those conversations and understanding the issues, it's about being as well informed so that you can make the decisions that are appropriate for you in your individual or family circumstances. It's my great pleasure to introduce the team uh, that will be working through a discussion and they all bring wonderfully varied experiences and expertise to the conversation and then we'll have an opportunity obviously to engage with you as well. Uh, Vanya in the middle. Um, Vanya is, uh, is going to be facilitating the session. She's a, she describes as having been a travel agent in a former life. That probably means that she's still um, intensely interested in travel, I suspect, and will never actually lose it. Um, and uh, also, of course, everyone here lives with CF in one context or another. Uh, Liz Balding. Liz, give everybody a wave. Hello. Hello. Liz on this end. Uh, Liz is a CNC. Uh, and part of the, uh, the team, the clinical team at the Princess Margaret Hospital. Corinne on the, the other end. Uh, Corinne is from down south. Uh, Corinne is, uh, is a mum of three children and as a family they uh, travel out of Tasmania. The rest of us often travel to Tasmania as often as we can get there. But Corinne and her family have travelled extensively and she'll share some of those experiences. Lisa on the far end. Welcome, Lisa. Uh, Lisa is an adult with CF. She's also a teacher um, and has travelled extensively again herself. And Kaz Boyd, Kaz is from Western Australia. And Kaz, too, um, has a, a mantra. She said it wasn't meant to be included, but if I may, Kaz, can I share it? Sure. All right, all right. Kaz's mantra in life is life is an opportunity. Benefit from it. Life is a beauty. Admire it. Life is a dream. Realise it. Life is a challenge. Meet it. Life is a duty. Complete it. Life is a game. Play it. Life is a promise. Fulfil it. Life is sorrow. Overcome it. Life is a song. Sing it. Life is a struggle. Accept it. Life is a tragedy. Confront it. Life is an adventure. Dare it. Life is luck. Make it. And life is life. Fight for it. I'll leave you in Vanya and the panel's very capable hands. Give a wave and this charming young man here will come and hand it over to you. Um, the second thing is, uh, in your packs that you would have received as you registered um, today or yesterday, you will have a yellow 
sheet like this. That's the feedback form. CF Australia is very keen to hear what you would consider inf you know, informative about what you've heard over the last two days. Um, please fill it in and hand it in at the registration desk before you leave today. Okay, so, uh, Corinne, as a travel agent and a mum of a CF child, what things do you take into consideration when planning a trip with your family? Okay, can everyone hear me? Hello. Hello. Okay, so I guess um, for our family, we've, we have done lots and lots of travelling um, and it really comes down to not so much CF, to be honest. Um, we really sort of sit around and talk about, okay, where do we want to head off to next? Um, and then, you know, depending on what the kids come back with and go, you know, we, we sort of discuss it a bit further. Um, and I guess we, we do, we then start thinking about the duration of the trip, how far is it, what we may need to do. So the further the trip may be, um, you know, if, if for example Europe or the US, obviously we would go for a longer period of time than if we were to go, say, to New Zealand or to Fiji. So, with our longer trips, we then tend to bring CF into it. Um, and you know, Joran may then Joran, who's 16 and has CF, um, we may then look at you know a tune-up as a precaution, um, and then we all discuss it with the team and basically go from there. And Lisa, you've lived in the UK, you've done a lot of travelling in Australia and overseas. Is there anything that you consider before planning to go? Um, I, I think there's a lot of contingency that goes in. Um, I was just saying to these guys here, we have a bit of a laugh. The silliest trip I planned was Morocco in the middle of summer. It was 55 degrees during the day. so That was probably the silliest thing I've done. but. Um, yeah, get it, getting those those plans in place and researching what you want to do and really deciding what you want to do and making sure that you put a, an extra day in here or there for rest and knowing, you know, if you can go three or four days before you need a rest or if you need a rest every other day. But really putting that into a plan and having that as a contingency before you can go. Great. Kaz, you've travelled both before and after your transplant. So is it different now in choosing where to go? No, definitely not. I'm probably the worst transplant recipient ever in that I go to Bali constantly. <laughs> um, although I do steer clear of the cholera carts. Um, no, it, it definitely not. No, life is for living. And um, I made CF a part of my life, not my life. So I just go wherever the travel takes me. Liz, when one of the families comes into clinic and says they want to go on a trip overseas or in Australia, what are the things that the CF team thinks are important when making decisions regarding travel? First of all, I consider myself a, a travel agent for you people and, and the rules are that you have to take me. Now that's <laughs> never been successful so I have to rethink that one. Um, I, th I think really what's so important for you guys is preparation and thought. Um, I come from the Peds Hospital so we like, you know, I think it's really important that your children are well Give us the opportunity to make your children well so that you all can enjoy your time uh, away. Um, and that includes time for maybe an, a, a tune-up. Somebody mentioned that before. We, we're not supposed to use the word tune-up anymore, so I didn't say that. Um, uh, and, and, you know, and maybe just even, even the top up with some uh, nebulised antibiotics. So I think, you know, preparation and a bit of time for us to get organised. We have a cut and paste letter that we uh, send with people. That's not a problem unless I get the phone call about four o'clock. Uh, we're actually leaving the next day. Mm, yeah, right, okay. And you guys do it all the time, all the time. Um, and that's fine if you've got email. It's not fine if you haven't. And, and you have to come and park at the hospital, get your letter. So it's really in your interest too to prepare very early. Okay, so road trips and camping are a favourite part of life for Australians. Um, Corinne, can you tell us about your experience with your family? How long were you on the road? Um, 
Back in 2011, we took off on a two-year trip around Australia. Um, and that's, that was probably our biggest trip that we've ever done in the sense of being away from normal clinic. Um, and it did take lots of preparation. So basically it was, the, the preparation was the key um, and we spent most of our time in the outback. So we're not big city people um, and, you know, we tried to avoid big city areas. So we had made contact at, with our clinic team. Joran had had a um, tune-up prior to leaving and we had organised plenty of medication. We had refrigeration, so that was the, a, a main thing for us. Um, so we could keep his pulmazine cold. Um, we had things like um, clinic details for each state and our clinic coordinator had made contact with all of the clinics, major clinics around Australia, just letting them know what we were doing um, in case we needed to contact them. Um, at one stage we did need to contact WA and, and we saw Liz several times, I think. Um, we also um, basically made sure that we could pick up for example, Pulmazine, because we could only get three months supply back then at any one time. So we had collection points in Darwin and in Perth. Um, so when we were coming through, we would ring ahead and just make sure that we could, it was all in order so we could then pick up another three months supply. Um, but, you know, saying that, it was the absolute best time of our lives. Our kids still talk about it to this day. And it, we've now been home for three years. Um, they did not wear shoes for two years. They, you know, the washing was non-existent um, because, you know, they lived in shorts and t-shirt. And we homeschooled them. Um, they were maybe doing schoolwork two hours a day um, and the rest of the time, you know, they were down the beach snorkelling, they were riding bikes, they were running amok just like kids do and it was away from technology, away from the stresses of life and and like I said, it was the best time of our life. Thank you. And so, Lisa, you've done lots of travel up the east coast of Australia, um, including by yacht. Um, where did you go and did you find it easy to manage the CF side of life? Um, on the yacht, it was um, really great fun. I was with the band The Wolverines and it was a fundraising trip for CF. Um, so they were really accommodating. Um, and there's lots of um, photos, and if anybody saw the documentary that went to air uh, a couple of years ago now, um, you could, there was actually images of me sitting on the deck of the boat um, doing my medication. Um, we just managed to hook into the generator and be able to do it that way. And um, yeah, they were, they, were, they were really great. And I, I think the, the hardest part about being on the yacht was we were traveling um, during the whale migration. So there was lots of sitting on deck in the middle of the night making sure we weren't tipped over by whales. So it was good fun. Okay. Now, travel, aid, uh, travel arrangements and particularly travel insurance are a real hot topic. Um, Kaz, what do you do about travel insurance? Well, unfortunately, having had a transplant now, I cannot get travel insurance. Um, the only insurance I can get is just a normal insurance cover baggage, um, change of flights, things like that, which is quite difficult if you considered you know, you want to go further, Europe, etc. Um, yeah, it's just a shame that no one will want to touch someone that's had a lung transplant, or any type of transplant, to be quite honest, but mainly lungs, you know. Um, Lisa, travel insurance is a challenge for CF travellers. So what do you do in regards to having or not having cover? Um, in my first initial trips many years ago, um, Malaysia and, and some cruising that I did early on, um, travel insurance was about twice as much as everybody else and was easily obtainable. But um, once I moved over to England in 2007, I was there for two and a half years, um, I, I chose not to go with travel insurance and I used uh, the reciprocal health agreement that I had with the UK initially. Once I started working, I was entitled to uh, what they call a national health insurance number, um, which is a bit like our Medicare, and I simply used the Medicare so-called system in the UK. Um, the UK then has agreements with Europe, um, so I was able to use the reciprocal agreements between England and parts of Europe once travelling through there. But uh, I, I think at this point, at least 
for, in my, my understanding, is if I'm not well enough, I don't go. Um, and if I am going, I, my dad's agreement with me was that I always had enough money in my bank account that if things weren't going right, that you get yourself to the closest airport and you get yourself home. It just wasn't worth the risk. Corinne, as a travel agent, what do you recommend about travel insurance? It's a really tricky question and, and one that over the years, um, I've been in a travel agent for 21 years and I've dealt with CF in that time um, and, and things have changed. But I definitely recommend that, you know, no matter whether you get cover for CF or not, you do take travel insurance because you will be covered for other things like luggage, travel delays. Classic example is, you know, the volcano in Bali erupts and you get stuck. You know, you're covered even if you don't get cover for CF. Um, there's no real, you know, trick, I guess you could say, as to whether you could get cover for CF or not. It really depends on the individual situation and it, at the time, really, how well you are or how sick you've been. Um, it depends on the insurance company. It varies. Um, sometimes you'll have luck with one particular company and you don't with another. Um, so. If you're planning an overseas trip and you want to try and get travel insurance for CF, my suggestion would be to get um, get onto it early. It may mean lots of forms. It may mean you know doctor's letters, etc. Um, you may need to try more than one company. Um, but yeah, it's perseverance and and knowing, like Lisa said, if you don't get insurance for CF, have a backup plan. So have a plan B. Um, have some money in an account that you could potentially, you know, come home if you need to. Um, I suppose you also have to remember that as a f if you're travelling as a family, for instance with us, um, my daughter's got CF, if we have to cancel because of her CF, then all of us are affected by that and we're not covered for cancellation penalties because of her pre-existing condition. So that's something you do have to consider. Um, there is a reciprocal healthcare cover um, that's arranged through Medicare. So the Australian government has agreements with 11 countries for healthcare of Australian residents. These countries are New Zealand, the UK, Republic of Ireland, Sweden, the Netherlands, Finland, Italy, Belgium, Malta, Slovenia and Norway. We've got a bit of information about it for you in the handouts. But basically it means that Australian residents, so it's not just Australian passport holders, it's Australian residents, um, can get help with the cost of essential medical, a medical treatment when visiting these countries. You must travel with your me Australian Medicare card to prove that you are part of the Medicare system back here in Australia. Um, otherwise they won't be able to help you. Um, there's a bit more detail about it on the handouts and I strongly recommend that if you want to look into it, you have a look on the website because as with everything, things change from time to time. Um, Liz, you have had patients who have been able to use... Oh, sorry, have you had patients who have been able to use the reciprocal arrangement? Uh, yes, I have. Um, and you pinched my line because I was going to say, um, although we do have reciprocal arrangements, as with everything with the government, it is a movable feast. So you need to check the updated section. Um, I, I think it is very different... Um, you know, people travelling with uh, Peds age, uh, you know, children as opposed to maybe not so well uh, adults. Um, our families seem to have come back unscathed. Uh, some of them have uh, used the UK system and others have used the Irish system. We have a huge contingent of... Uh, we've got an Irish invasion in, um, in WA, which is great fun. Um, yeah, gosh, I, I love the way they speak. <laughs> those, of, those of you who know me know that I speak and, and I love listening to them, actually. <laughs> um, so, so, look, once again, I think it's really worth checking each time you go. Don't rely on the information from last time. But it does seem to work. I was just talking to the Kaleidico people and it would seem that, um, you know, this is going to be an interesting... Um, an interesting uh, thing for obtaining medication. And it would seem that, you know, at times you will need to come back to the UK to access these sorts of things. So these sorts of things are, are things that you need to find out about. So explore, not just the world, but explore before you go.
Um, again, we stress that you shouldn't rely on the Medicare arrangement for your um, insurance cover while you're away. And it only um, covers you for what they call essential medical treatment. So, um, yeah, have a look at it and certainly read very carefully the um, policy document that you've got regarding your travel insurance just to make sure you understand the limitations and what you're covered. Um, so medication logistics, a big part of everyday life in, with CF is the medication. When you're travelling, there is the added issue of caring for and carrying the medication with you through customs. So Liz, what does PMH, oh sorry that's the Children's Hospital in Perth, um, offer or recommend to the travellers as they head off? Okay, well, I mean, it's, it's been interesting with the, uh, the barley cloud. You all know about that? The volcanic ash? You must know about it, yeah? I know we live on the other side of the world, but, you know. Um, <laughs> I, um, uh, we, we had some parents over there recently, and, you know, I mean, the thing is to take plenty of medication with you in your hand luggage. She actually took over a week's worth in excess of her requirements. However, we had a ma massive phone call, you know, uh, and, and yes, it must, um, it must be really scary uh, being over there, and um, what on earth do I do? Um, anyhow, fortunately, the, 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 cloud, the cloud decided, the karma arrived and sorted it all, and, uh, you know, we were lucky that that all came together. But, I mean, you know, that's, that I would consider it a week's additional uh, medication reasonable planning. So, you know, it's really, really very, very difficult. Um, our paperwork, uh, I, I, the letter that we cut and paste doesn't actually have the diagnosis. And, I mean, I, I really don't know that it's anybody's business what your di child or your own diagnosis is. Um, we just say that you've got a, a severe respiratory condition that needs um, some care and attention. We include medications on there. But it seems to me, you know, I, I mean, I, I remember taking a, a, a child from Perth to Melbourne on the plane and the, and the flight attendant came up to me and said, can I know what's wrong with this child? And I said, no. I thought, excuse me. Listen, Trolley Dolly, you do your stuff and I'll do my stuff, you know? <laughs> Seriously. I must admit, I was quite gobsmacked. And she said, oh, I am a nurse. Oh, congratulations, so am I, darling. Um, <laughs> so, so, yes, but as I've said before, make sure you give us time to get your letter together. Um, please, please. Um, but yeah, I think that's the main, main thing, including your medications, have enough to travel with, uh, appropriate um, storage facilities, carry facilities for them, backups of all your nebs, tubing, blah, blah, you know, all this, all this stuff you need to, you need to have contingency plan. And if you're taking a little, you know, a neb pump, make sure you've got a spare little black doodah thingy, the connection. Because these are the things that kids notoriously um, lose. I'm going to say the kids lose them because we don't have any kids here. Um, but, you know, they do get lost. And these things are like gold to get hold of anywhere else in the world. So, yes, here we go. Thank you. Um, Corinne, what have you done? Well, you have recommended travelling with copies of your Australian scripts. Why would you do that? Um, it's really just a precaution. Um, we've had a couple of instances where we didn't early on. Um, and basically, often, I mean, when you're in a different country and they don't necessarily have the medication, um, you know, if you go to a pharmacist, you show them the, the script, they will be able to either... In some countries, they can dispense the script. For example, Ventolin. Um, you know, they can. In, we had an instance in Singapore where they could just give you a. a sorry, they could dispense the script. Um, although they're not actually using the script, they can dispense the medication. But they needed to see something with the patient name on it and the actual medication before they would. Um, and we had not been to a doctor, so it was simply just in that case. Um, also, if you've got a copy of your script. Some countries won't do anything at a pharmacy, but you can then take that to a G GP. It's just much quicker to explain to them, basically. 
Um, Kaz, what important steps do you take regarding your medication when travelling? I had this incident, um, I was 16, so we're talking 32 years ago, um, where my mother decided it'd be great if we went to Singapore. I'd been quite sick previously. She thought, yep, we'll go to Singapore. And um, that was back when mum was looking after my medication. My enzyme, she thought she packed enough and clearly didn't. So short of sitting on the toilet for two days of our holiday, we actually went to the hospital in Singapore and they gave me these look-alike enzymes which were just like taking Tic Tacs. So now I have a three-point system where I write down my list, I check my list, and I check that list again. It's really important, as Liz um, mentioned, to take more medication that you actually need. And don't just rely on the one person to, to pack it, actually get someone else to help you check them as well. Um, so one important aspect of is with the medication is keeping it cold for some of them, um, particularly on long flights or road trips. Lisa, how do you manage this? I have show and tell. <laughs> this little packet, it's called a Fryo bag. There was a picture up there before. Um, the inner packet is, um, it's full of crystals and yet you just hydrate it in water. Um, and as those uh, crystals dehydrate, um, unlike lots of chemical reactions that make heat, it removes heat. So it's, it's a cold reaction. So as that dehydrates, it's, it stays cold. And as the, obviously it's dehydrating, you can just, I was just using my bottle of water to just tip over the top of it every night and make sure that it, it stayed uh, hydrated. Now that, that will keep your medication around eight degrees or thereabouts, depending on the external temperature. It's not perfect for Pulmazyme for extensive periods of time. I did have a chat with my um, pharmacist at the hospital on Tuesday when I was at clinic, and I said, how long would you put, you know, how long would you keep Pulmazyme, you know, not completely cold? And she said, oh, a couple of days, but then you really need to get it back colder again. So, you know, on that logic, that that's, that's good for any sort of flight to get you to a, a hotel or in my case I was um, backpacking so it, it wasn't perfect but it was the best option that was available and I think is still the best option that's available. Just to give you an idea about um, the, the capacity of these, I had um, two types of insulin um, and enough pulmazyme for seven weeks and it took two of these so they do expand quite a bit. In your fr yeah. RIO. There's information about it in your handout. Um, I'm, I'm happy to pass it around and you can yeah. feel that it is in fact actually cold. I know they sell them in Australian pharmacies, so um, go on the website and have a look. There was actually a list of um, Australian pharmacies where they're available. Um, you do have to make sure. I'd strongly recommend having a chat to your pharmacist or your CF team to make sure that the medication you have is appropriate to carry in something like that. Um, so if you don't have a Frio bag, Corinne, how do you cope? <laughs> right, well, we, <laughs> we usually put our, um, all our medication always comes with us in our carry-on. We do not travel with it in our checking um, luggage simply because of the chance of it getting lost. Um, there's never a 100% guarantee that an airline will actually manage to get your checking bag even if you're just on one flight um, to the destination. So um, we always do it in our carry-on bag um, and we have just a small esky that we generally use um, just with some ice packs like the the flexi ones. Um, most of Joran's meds are actually now no longer require refrigeration apart from, from his Pulmazyme. Um, everything else is now either the dry inhaled powder, which is fantastic. So, yeah. And so, um, I suppose you've touched on it. Is there anything else you do to manage the risk of losing a bag with medication inside? So, you, do you spread it across? I mean, there's what, five of you travelling? 
do you spread it across people's bags or is no, it all generally in one bag? We generally now, Joran just takes it in his backpack along okay. with his um, aero neb, which is just that's what he uses all the time just to do his um, nebs. And yeah, so he just carries it all. It's easy when we get to customs. So, you know, if they do want it, we, we always say that we're carrying drugs and they go, Is that medication? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, generally actually we're not actually needing to show them anything so but if they were to say well can we have a look then we simply just have to open one bag and it's mm. all there so mm. yeah. okay um another big issue is managing physio on the move so sometimes it is really on the move because sometimes um, you're constantly changing location if you're touring around so corinne again how do you guys cope with this um, again, Joran's pretty much self-manages his physio now. He does, um, and he has for probably about four or five years, he does a technique called autogenic drainage, or I think it's also called active breathing cycle. Um, but, yeah, so he does his autogenic drainage, which he can basically do anywhere. He can do it sitting on a chair, he can do it watching TV. I don't have to, there's no hands-on from me, um, he does it when he feels he needs to, um, and he does it quite well. Um, he's been used as guinea pigs in physio sessions and, and to show other physios how it's done, so it's quite funny. Um, and you can actually hear the plugs moving up um, when he does do it. Um, <laughs> sorry. You're having a nice Memories. lunch. Memories. <laughs> He also um, he also does his pari pep, so that's you know quite small, so it's easily sort of just to pack in the bag and off we go and yeah. Um, Lisa, what do you uh, so you too do the autogenic drainage, don't you? So um, I think um, Corinne's pretty well explained the system, but also how do you manage um, making sure that you're not overtaxing yourself while on holiday? Yeah, the autogenic drainage is, is, a, is a great little tool to have in your, your uh, arsenal. Um, I can recall trying to explain it to the gentleman in the train through Italy as to why I was making some funny sounds and trying to do it in Italian. Difficult. Um, <laughs> he was interested. Um, as, as for, you know, kind of really managing myself while I'm away, you know, there's those days where you know, like, going to Disneyland for the day, you know, you know that it's a full-on day, it's an all day. And then the next day was rest day. It was an alternate day arrangement. Um, but certainly, you know, even even through Europe, you know, if I, I knew that um, there was one particular trip I did where I knew that I had to walk from a, um, a ferry terminal um, through, through city, through the town to a train terminal to get my connection. And it was 2Ks and I was going to be carrying my... 20 kilo backpack. Um, in the planning it was good, um, I was not happy when I did it, um, but I certainly knew that the rest of that day was done. I, I, I'd done enough that day. So planning that, those sorts of things and knowing that sometimes you just got to go and lie on a beach rather than go and walk up a mountain, so to speak. And um, you had an experience with your nebulizer whilst in Russia. Can you just fill us in on that? <laughs> okay, so um, while in the UK my nebulizer broke um, and because eFlows at that time were really cheap, like three, £325 I think I paid, um, my dad bought it for me so that I could travel. So I'd been using it for a while and it was great, it fitted in my handbag and I was able to go to Glastonbury Festival with my eFlow in my bag and you know, all that great stuff. And then I got into um, St. Petersburg and it wouldn't turn on. And I was, I was starting to do a bit of a freak out. And I'm going, oh, just recharge it again, you know, put, plug it into the wall and nothing was working. And um, I got onto the Pari website and I found out that they had an office in Moscow where I was due to be in two days time. So I contacted them and said, hey, look, my eFlow is not working. Can you help me out? So two days later when I arrived in Moscow, um, the representative from Pari in her car picked me up at the train station, drove me back to their office. The technician fixed my eFlow. She took me back to the train station and I was on my way. 
And I actually, I actually sent an email thanking Pari for not only inventing a device that allowed me to have a life, but then servicing it so that I could continue to enjoy travel, which was what it was for. Um, travelling on planes takes you into a fairly unnatural environment. Um, I don't think it's an, a place of choice to be in such close contact with a large number of people for a long period of time. Um, so what challenges do you face on plane trips and Kaz, do you take extra care in the plane environment? Um, I'm hopeless on a plane because I feel the cold absolutely terribly. So I've got about three blankets over me um, and I don't think any germs get in through those. Um, personally, I was, when I had my transplant, I was working in the medical profession and I went to the physician and said, look, I've been offered back my job. And he said, you've got more chance of catching bugs on a train or a plane. And, you know, what was the reason you had your transplant for? And I said, well, to lead a normal life. He said, well, go and do that. And that's how I look at plane travel. I mean, obviously, if someone was coughing and sneezing next to me, I would ask to be moved. But, you know, it's part of everyday life and I want to travel, so... Mm. Liz, how careful should we be regarding hygiene and do we get on board armed with our Dettol wipes? <laughs> I'm, I'm under instructions here. <laughs> Look, I mean, planes are, are seriously the worst places in the world you could be on. Um, I would suggest, if you know, make sure you've had your flu shot. Did you hear me? Flu shot. Um, that's, that's great. Uh, look, I, I think the nurse in me says, goodness sake, you know, be, be very, very careful. And we've got families who use masks a whole bit. Um, the person in me says, oh my God, enjoy your travel um, and be sensible. So uh, I, I think really think about it. As Kaz says, if you've got somebody sitting next to you coughing and sneezing. I, I reckon maybe maybe dead old wipes for your kids. Long haul toilets are not joyous places. So I mean, you know, that's what, that's what I mean. Some common sense. It, it, even even I now take um, Alco wipes, and we were flying up. Oh, we're doing one of our outreaches, and one of our consultants had to help out. Liz, have you got any Alco? And you know what? I had the wrong handbag. Seriously. I mean, a nurse with the wrong handbag, how dare I? <laughs> but guess what? All Liz's bags have got alcohol in them for maybe, maybe the physicians, but maybe anyone else. So look, you know, enjoy life, you know, seriously. I think a worse place to actually catch bugs and things was on cruise boats, particularly in the shared toilet part of a cruise boat. Um, now, Lisa. You have to use an oxygen supply when flying. Um, can you explain to us the system and the logistics? Oh dear. This is dependent on your airline and you need to contact them ASAP. Like book the flight, pick up the phone. Okay, because they generally only have one medical place on each plane. And if that place is already taken, they need to change your flight. So before you make any further plans, that needs to happen. They'll then tell you the arrangement for oxygen. Um, and obviously, I'll, I'll give you some examples about the ways I've travelled, but they change. They're, they're a, a moving situation. So I flew with BA back in 2007. They simply did the nasal prongs to the roof of the plane and tapped into the oxygen within the plane. And that was really easy, really awesome. Um, Eddie had um, delayed me in London for 14 hours because they've used oxygen cylinders. The oxygen cylinders hadn't arrived from Abu Dhabi, so I had to wait for them to arrive. Um, when they did arrive, I did get the extra seat next to me and I had two 10 kilo oxygen cylinders sitting on the seat next to me. Um, and I was placed in a position that was not brilliant. Um, and it, Partway through the flight, um, half asleep, a gentleman got his toe caught in the pipe, pulls the oxygen cylinder off the seat, yanks my head to the side and I'm now awake. Uh, the oxygen cylinder landed head down, the top popped off it and there's an oxygen cylinder on the floor of the plane hissing and all he could do was run away. <laughs> I knew where he was. Um, the other thing that happened through a Delta flight 
couple of years ago, we've got we've managed to get the guys to loan us a little pump. Is um, a pump similar to this one? So this this has to obviously be part of your carry on. Um, he did show me how to turn it on. So it's just a case of turning it on and selecting your flow rate. Now the issue with these is obviously it depends on how long your flight is. There was one out there, I think he said it was two hours, was it? This one's about four and a half to six, depending on your flow rate. When I travelled to um, America being a, a pretty long flight, I was actually given two spare batteries. So I had the pump plus three monster, you know, old analogue mobile phone paver uh, type batteries to carry as well. Um, and although the machine has a mute button to stop it making noise when it's not happy, um, it does make little beeping noises and the people around you get a little bit freaked out that you've got this pump on the plane. So sometimes it's good to sort of just say to someone next to you, oh look, I'm alright, I just, my lungs don't work so great so I just have to put this machine on and I'll be okay and they tend to be okay with that. Thank you. Um, now, things don't always go to plan, so you can expect that things might go wrong whilst you're away. We've heard from Lisa about her agreement with her dad for some money on a credit card that can be used in case of emergency travel. Um, Corinne, how did you and your husband Daniel plan for something going wrong on your Australian road trip? Um, we, we basically, from the moment we planned to set off um, for two years, we decided that we would have a separate account with basically emergency money in that um, in case we were somewhere in the remoteness of it all and we needed to come home um, or basically Joran needed to see um, a doctor or clinic um, either locally or locally I mean you know it may have been 800 kilometres away um, so we might need you know a short flight or we might need to return back to Tassie and you know admit him. Um, and it did happen. Um, we were out about 150 kilometres north of Carnarvon on a station where we were living, or living, we were there for about four months working on the station on the Ningaloo Reef. Um, just a little piece of paradise. Um, Joran had been struggling for a while with um, ABPA or Aspergillus. And every, we would go into Carnarvon every fortnight um, to do our fortnightly groceries. Um, before we headed back to the station. And he would also um, s basically get some bloods done and also um, lung function done at the local hospital. Um, and his FEV1 just basically kept dropping. So at one point it dropped down to the low 40s and he was normally sitting around 75, 80%. Um, so at that point in time we were like, look, we just, we can't wait any longer. So. Uh, we made the decision to fly me and Joran back to Tassie, um, which meant a drive up to Exmouth, which was about six hours for us, and then fly home via Perth and Melbourne back to Hobart, um, where we had two weeks at the Royal and then return back to the be with the rest of the family. So, you know, to us it was simply part of what we would just do. Um, we had. You know, it, it was a plan B. It was not ideal because Daniel was left on the station with the other two kids. Um, but it worked and we made it work, um, you know, and that's just, we've always been of that mindset that whenever something, you know, it may go wrong. And, and in every, in normal life, you know, without C, if things go wrong. So it's just having that backup plan and, and being ready. Um, Liz, what help can the local, the local Australian clinic give when their patients are overseas? Well, thank God for technology. I, I mean, this has well made the world very accessible. Um, we have phone calls, uh, emails, um, etc., from all over the world. Um, we're pretty, pretty good at um, getting information, um, copies of, um, as somebody up there said, Lisa, I think it was, um, of, of scripts, etc., etc., just about anywhere. Um, and, and, of course, um, giving details of contact, close contact people. Um, our centre is very uh, world orientated, and so uh, our physicians have probably got contacts just about anywhere in the world. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, just, just 
it's, it's probably easier to actually get hold of your local people to drive it from this end to out there than it is the other end sometimes. So, um, yeah, but you, you know who we are and where we are. I think it's very useful to use that. Thanks. Um, Kaz, so we're now heading on to the unplanned um, when things go wrong. Kaz, you've got a good example of something not going to plan. What happened when you were in Bali after your transplant? Um, having a lung transplant, I'm on immune suppressing drugs that need to be taken every day. Otherwise, of course, I risk going into rejection. Um, and being as far out as I am, that's something that's not a risk I want to take. So I'm in Bali and realise that I've left one of my main anti-rejection drugs on my bed at home. So there's a major panic. I ring my mum, can you please go get them? Can you ring Sue Moray, who's our CNS at... Um, Sir Charles Gardner. Anyway, cut a long story short, they were bought over by a Garuda pilot, kept in the cockpit with him and delivered by the pilot to me. <laughs> so I've never been in a cockpit, but the drugs have. Um, Corinne, your Fiji holiday, how did you manage when you left the salt tablets behind? Um, we, we, first of all, we went to the local pharmacy in Sigatoka, hoping that they may actually sell them. However, they didn't. So the only um, solution was to make our own. And <laughs> so we basically <laughs> emptied out enzyme capsules, um, sat on the balcony with a plate of normal table salt and filled each of the enzyme capsules with the table salt. And there we went. So they were our homemade salt tablets. <laughs> Excellent. Um, OK. so. In saying that expect the unexpected, there's um, always a bit of a funny story. We are running close to time, so I'll have to keep this short. But um, Kaz, travelling back to Sydney for your, one of your post-transplant appointments, what did the guy on the plane say next to you? I, you know, you served a meal, I've got my Creon out and I'm doing it rather discreetly, trying to hold it under, hide it away. And he, he had a look and he's like, oh man, what are they? And I said, oh, you know, it doesn't matter. I was, I was really quite embarrassed. And he said, um, oh, can I have some? So I sold him, I sold him two Creon for $50. <laughs> That's what one of my friends said. He's probably constipated. And that was like 20 years ago. <laughs> Anyone want to buy some Creon for $50? <laughs> Conference price. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got time for like two questions. If anyone's got any questions they'd like to ask. Corinne, you were saying that you travelled all the way back to Tasmania for an admission. Why didn't you go to Perth? Because you said you flew to Perth, then to Melbourne, then to... So what was stopping you from going to the Perth hospital and having the CF team liaise with the Tasmanian team? Yeah, and we did actually think about that at the time. Um, I guess from our point of view was we would have had to go to an unknown clinic. And I mean, I, uh, afterwards we did actually see so, um, Liz and the team in Perth um, after we'd gone back. But it was really, for us, it was a matter of either going to Perth on my own with Joran, not knowing really anybody, no, no family support, or sitting on a plane for, you know, an extra seven hours and getting home where there was family, we had support, you know, we knew the team. So, yeah, it was sort of a, a, a no thing, uh, no questions really for us. It was, yeah, that's just the decision we made. But we could have gone to the Perth um, hospital. It's been mentioned a couple of times about having a tune-up before leaving. I guess most people reality are holidays two or three weeks. At that point, going away for such a short amount of time, would you still recommend having a tune-up or is that only for larger, like a Europe holiday for two or three months? Look, I, um, pre-transplant, I, I went to Singapore quite a few times and Hong Kong, so I would um, have my tune-up and then I'd get on the plane, basically pulling the IV line out as we're driving to the airport, getting on the plane. Um, and I just found that personally that kept me quite well. I yeah. 
You agree, Lisa? Yeah. I mean, it all depends. I know we've been on big trips to Europe. We, our daughter hasn't had a tune-up, but we were booked to go to Asia at one point, and she did end up in hospital, and we got her out, and the next day we flew off on our holiday. So um, it all depends, yeah. Okay, we hope you've found this session encouraging and helpful. Travel is a great experience and does allow for seriously wonderful memories. Our aim today was that the session would give you more confidence and that you're better equipped for managing CF whilst travelling so that you can just pack your bags and head off. A big thank you today for our panel for your time. Lisa has come in just for today and she's come up from, if you're from New South Wales, she's come in from Picton, so thank you very much. Um, to all of you for being here, and to all of you for being here and happy to share with us your thoughts and stories. Thank you to Liz and Kaz and Corinne and Lisa.